uh, the projector will get, they'll say, like, this is in use by another device and not show the slides. That is bizarre. All right, cool. All right, you can switch over to the uh, main one. Okay. All right, thanks for coming out. This is uh, clear as FUD. And this is the second time I've given this talk, uh, but it's been heavily revised since the first time. So uh, a bit about me first. So my name is Chris Madalena. I'm at C. Madalena on Twitter and IRC and several other places you might have seen me. So just kind of a brief resume on me. I have a bachelor's uh, from uh, Ferris State University in information security and intelligence. And I'm an information security analyst uh, at eCentire, where I do a lot of project management, do a lot of phishing campaigns, and I'm involved in a lot of uh, VAs and pen testing. Uh, and I've been about 10 years in various roles in IT. Uh, my resume is not very interesting, but most of these, kind of the, the point I want to make is that I've always been in a customer-facing role. So even right now, as a security analyst, I deal with a lot of different clients, and that's, uh, that's really what I want to talk about today is how the different people that I interact with all kind of view, dis uh, view and understand technology differently. And a lot of this is influenced by the media they consume, things they encounter in their daily lives, and a lot of this actually does have a direct impact on the users themselves and the security field. We're going to take a look at a few real-world examples later on, uh, but first, my disclaimer. So. I am kind of here on uh, here representing eCentire, but this presentation just represents my own views and opinions, yada yada. So training and education. Uh, obviously, we, we send people to training. They get training from various sources, you know, just social interactions, you know, just uh, from their employer for uh, workplace training. They're getting training from a hundred different directions. But a lot of it just kind of slips through the cracks because they're not told why it's relevant. So education kind of goes one step further, and that's what makes it different. It actually explains why. It explains why and if it's relevant, why it's important to them. And right now, I believe we have a problem with security where we're not actually educating users, we're just training them. We're training them to avoid certain types of phishing emails. We're training them not to click certain types of links or not to go to certain types of websites. And that's actually becoming more and more of a problem as there's actually just kind of danger everywhere and not so much in these one little silos that we tell them to look out for. And we also, on top of that, have some interference with our education. Uh, we're going to look at that here in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, but there are other things out there kind of creating these gray areas that are confusing and causing kind of a hazy understanding. So it's a little bit even harder to educate the users. So I'd be kind of a hypocrite if I didn't tell you why this is relevant to you. So this quote from Quinn Norton, one of my favorite journalists, kind of sums it up, that computers and computing are broken. We have dozens of different technologies that we use every day that are all kind of built on fundamentally broken technology. You know, think of email. We haven't really changed it in decades. But we keep building upon it, changing things. We use it for all kinds of different stuff that we actually rely on, but it's kind of broken. But if you work in IT, whether it's security or anywhere else, you kind of understand why it's broken. You know how to work around it, how to patch it or fix it, or you know make some changes so it does what it wants you to do. For a normal users, it's just kind of broken, and they don't really understand a lot of the ways it's broken. How it's you know might be leaking information, that sort of thing. And this has a real direct impact. This misunderstanding of technology, we end up having problems uh, where uh, the users remain uneducated, and we start seeing repercussions from that. So some of the ones that we'll look at here in a little bit are things like changes to the Metasploit licensing, where if you saw at RSA this year, Rapid7 had to announce that due to you know, uh, encryption export laws, they now had to require anyone outside of the US or Canada to submit a letter explaining why they needed a Metasploit license. Uh, we also have changes, the proposed changes to the CFAA, um, the, uh, the Wassner stuff from earlier this month, or last month, rather. and it's just going to get worse from there as users remain un uh, uneducated and they don't understand uh, why they want these changes to these laws because they think that they're being protected by the government, but they end up actually just kind of making it harder for uh, security researchers and the like. 
And a big part of this is that even regardless of how broken the technology is or not, we've actually made it incredibly easy to use, which is awesome because we have things like touch screens and these devices that are constantly connected to the internet that they're able to use and get online with without much trouble. And then on top of that, they also have motivation to do it. They have Twitter and Facebook and all kinds of you know, things that they have their email. And this is really awesome because it actually has taken people who at one point had trouble with a computer and are actually now able to get online and they can get out there, they can learn things, and they're not so much in a cloistery little silo anymore where they just felt comfortable, they just go to Facebook and then log off. They can now, they're, they're clicking links and they're moving around. The downside of this is that their lack of understanding makes them really easy targets. They're targeted by scammers you know, with phishing emails. They might accidentally recklessly expose their PII to, you know, just by providing it just kind of everywhere it's asked for, whether it's required or not. And this puts them at risk also if they lose their devices. They're not locking those devices. They're putting all kinds of stuff on their phone. And then they lose it. They don't understand what can actually be taken off of it if they haven't locked it down. And on top of this has the potential to generate some fear, which is kind of what we were just talking about, where as they become concerned about one thing or another and they don't understand why, because it's more of a fear of the unknown, it moves on to, and then they start pushing for things like changes to CFAA. But they don't just come up with these fears on their own. So there's all kinds of things that are actually providing uh, these sources of fear and kind of planting the seeds. I just kind of referred to as kind of programming here. And it's just kind of, it's all their news and entertainment, things that they hear. Uh, kind of a, I, I have a picture up here of CSI Cyber, um, but it's only one of many examples. Uh, and then I have a couple of, uh, these are article uh, headlines that have kind of really stuck with me from late 2014 and 2015. This Washington Post article, the headline's not too crazy, but uh, we're actually going to talk a little bit more in depth on that interview and how it's kind of a ridiculous article. Uh, but then you have things like this New York Times article where they really, the article wasn't necessary. And it just used a lot of scare quotes, you know, just put quotes around everything, how you use WGIT to scrape websites and things like that. It was just really unnecessary and was really just there to try to get you to click on Snowden and use low-cost tools to best the NSA. And then that, of course, misinforms users as they read that. And then you had the Forbes article who kind of went really far with it, you know, meet the hackers who sell spy tools to crack your PC and get paid six figures fees, uh, which was, you know, a whole article on, on the Grug and, and other like zero day sellers. Now the thing though with things like CSI Cyber is that this doesn't necessarily cause damage directly. So there's all kinds of things like CSI Cyber and most people are, are looking at it, if they watch that show, they understand that it's not based on real life. But what the problem is, the way I see it, is that You've probably seen a movie or had, you know, or just been talking about a show like that where someone asked you, like, ah, oh, you really can't do that, right? And they know that you can't, but they're asking kind of jokingly, but it's because that they understand just enough to know that technology is expanding every day and they can't really keep up with it because they're not looking at it, but you probably are. So they're kind of curious, what exactly can you do? Most of the time, you're probably going to laugh it off and say no, but that's also kind of an educational uh, opportunity where we can say like, well, no, we can't do that, but here's kind of how far they got, how far we could go in that direction, or you know, what we might be looking at in the next few years. And when we just say like, you know, no, or they get an idea of their own, this creates a gray area where they're not sure where the fiction begins and the real stuff has ended. And this leads to warp touchstones. So, we have touchstones and keywords, especially in InfoSec, that mean a lot to us. You know, I don't have to come up to you and constantly explain, you know, what I'm dealing with. I can just say malware, and you understand already what I'm saying. And then we can even go a step further, and I can, I can mention CryptoLocker or something like that, and you instantly understand what I'm talking about. I don't have to explain what it does, how the infection got started, or things like that. You kind of already get a good idea of what I'm talking about just from a couple of words. Because these touchstones, they aid in communication, and they carry a lot of meaning. They they complete that picture. But the counter-programming kind of aids in miscommunication. It spreads fear and it, it offers a very incomplete picture that then leaves it up to the user's interpretation to figure out where they go from there. But I'm, I've been picking on the media for the last couple of slides, but it's, it, this is kind of stuff is everywhere. Like this is a uh, Spotify notification, basically just the Spotify 
installation on this PC is corrupt, but it just goes out of its way to say, you know, well, maybe it's been affected by a virus. There's no reason for that. It just, it's just going to throw it out there and then not explain it all to the user of why it thinks you might be, you know, why you might have a virus or anything. It's just going to kind of leave the user to puzzle over what they should do from here. So I want to take a look at one of our, our favorite touchstones, uh, the word hack. It's kind of a, it's a very brief history of it. It's been around, that word has been around since the 1300s. And it used to refer to laborers, eventually it referred to prostitutes, later taxi cab drivers. And eventually, in the 60s and 70s, it started being used, uh, this is kind of more anecdotal, but MIT students say they started using it to refer to pranksters. And that's kind of when they started adding that ER to the end and saying, you know, like the hacker was a prankster. But obviously in 1976, this is what most people think of it, is that it's someone who enjoys programming for its own sake. And that's what a lot of people really hang on to, is that 1976 version. But in 1984, that's when we start getting the more negative view of it of one who gains unauthorized access to com you know, computer records. And there's been kind of a, a struggle over whether or not the word hacker and hack is negative or, or more positive since then. And then, of course, we have kind of the word that everyone likes to hate, which is the word cyber. So the interesting thing that I, I think is interesting about cyber is that it's actually remained really consistent. So we need these keywords to be consistent or for the work for communication. So kind of funny enough, cyber is actually being more useful in communication than the word hack. Um, so, but at the same time, hack and cyber are the words that mean something very different to different groups. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, the InfoSec community really embraces hacker as a positive word. It has a lot of flavor, it's weighty, it has a lot of history, they really like it. And it's, it's a very positive thing. You know, usually we refer to the riffraff, uh, not as hackers, but as, uh, you know, as miscreants or criminals or skiddies. We don't really think of them as, as hackers, at least not when we come to a place like this and where it's a, it's a positive word. But, the community really rejects cyber, whereas the media is kind of flip-flopped on all of this. Hack is a very negative word. It kind of is an all-encompassing word for a, an attack on a computer system. And cyber is something that they use a lot of. And it's kind of hilariously mis -over, you know, overused. It's tacked onto the beginning of every word. They really love cyber. But I do actually strongly believe it's something we can actually use to communicate with users a bit more easily. And this... Uh, I like this quote from Alex Stamos, the CISO of Yahoo, where he says, if the word's on a patch on somebody's shoulder, we've probably already lost. And I think this is interesting for a couple of reasons, because the idea of losing against a word, you know, shows that that's just how, how much we've been attacking that word and how much, kind of how much energy we put into hating that word and trying to push against its use that we think that we've lost something. When really we can, it does need to be used less, certainly, but we can actually use that to talk to users because they understand what cyber means. And we can use that in a way to communicate what we're doing. And this idea of, of whether or not hacker is good or bad is, is actually a pretty old idea. This is, these are a couple of quotes from, uh, that I like from Clifford Stoltz, uh, The Cuckoo's Egg from 1989, in which he mentions, <laughs> he actually calls out the fact that Software wizards like to be called hackers. They really like the word, and they actually resent the scofflaws who appropriated the word. And then one of his friends tells him, in relay to that, that a few morons can spoil everything. So what actually is a hack today, then? So what we call an attack, what we would probably call an attack, is often referred to as a hack by the media. They just kind of use that word for everything. So it's become this very scary word that uh, ends up encompassing everything from DDoS and website defacements to something that's actually like a large-scale security breach where you know, data was stolen or there was a lot of damage done. So these events are all being reported on the same level as big security breaches. So, like, for example, we understand that US Central Command was not hacked uh, back in January. Uh, but Twitter was. And even that's probably kind of a stretch because is knowing someone's password really much of a hack? No, not really. This was just a lot of vandalism, and it was cleaned up pretty quickly. It wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, what was more interesting of it was, you know, what was their incident response like exactly? You know, how did they get a hold of the password? Was the password any good? 
there was a couple of interviews that went around at the same time, kind of coincidentally, where some people were talking to interns on uh, uh, at the Capitol, like you know, White House interns and congressmen interns, and they said that passwords is kind of thrown all around all over the place because so many people need access to something like a Twitter account or an email account that they use for for PR or something like that. That they just kind of you know it'll be on Post-it notes hanging up on the you know hanging up on the office. People will just speak it out loud in public. They'll send it in text messages and emails. They don't really treat it as a sensitive thing. And a couple of them actually said, like, well, yeah, we feel kind of cloistered here at the Capitol because you got military and Secret Service kind of everywhere. Uh, everything feels very secure. And everyone there is kind of more or less working for the government in their, you know, kind of in their general vicinity. So they don't feel weird about just saying a password to someone across the hallway. But we do get these really sensationalist headlines um, for for these sorts of attacks, you know. So this is actually uh, just a, a quick DuckDuckGo search I did for um, Lizard Squad hack Sony to see what would come up because they've actually been, you know, they've had a couple of attacks attributed to them against Sony. The articles all come up with roughly similar headlines, but it's actually only the first one refers to the Sony Motion Pictures attack, which was the one that was really damaging. They actually that was an actual security breach, whereas the others were just DDoS attacks on Christmas against Sony Online Entertainment, a totally different arm of the company. And those were, if you're unfamiliar with it, was when they decided to try to just take down uh, various game services on Christmas morning just to kind of spoil Christmas for, for kids that were getting a, a new Xbox One or PlayStation 4 or something. And But these were all kind of reported as like big attacks against large companies, even though most of them were just DDoSes. But sensationalist headlines aren't really all that new. Uh, there was recently, was a, journalist, a journalist that I actually really respect uh, started writing for a website that is known for very sensationalist headlines. And when he was asked, you know, hey, you've really changed your style. Are you being forced to write these really ridiculous headlines? He said, no, no, no. We're trying to get to the emotional truth of the story right out of the gate so you know what you're getting. When then that is one way to justify these, but it's really kind of ridiculous. It really sets the mood for the rest of the article and kind of twists the story to match that headline. The, even that is might be your gut reaction, emotional response. It's uh, not, not the best idea to be throwing that out there because a lot of people aren't going to understand maybe exactly what they read in the article, but they're going to end up getting this more emotional response from it. And this is where I want to talk about that Washington Post article I mentioned. So. The problem isn't just these sensationalist headlines. It's In some cases, it's the fact that the article even kind of exists to begin with. The media attention paid to groups like the Lizard Squad kind of legitimizes them. It creates confusion around the word hack, and it really makes them appear like they're much more of a threat than they probably actually are, uh, or at least as a whole. There might be a couple of, you know, couple of people out there that affiliate with, you know, are affiliated with these groups in some way or help them that perhaps are actually are out there doing something bad, but for the most part, they're just kind of online vandals. But we treat them like they're these, like they're some sort of criminal underground. And back when they were really kind of in the news constantly, the uh, BBC and the Washington Post paid a lot of attention to them. The BBC actually had a couple of them on, well, at least suppose, you know, people who claim to be part of the group on for an interview. And the Washington Post reached out and uh, wanted to interview one of them on their DDoS attacks for, for Christmas. And kind of a little bit of setup for this is that the journalist uh, knew enough he wanted verification that this was, in fact, someone who was part of the Lizard Squad. And so he asked him, he's like, well, I know you're, you're, you guys have a Twitter account. Tweet at me from, from your Twitter account. So what the guy did, and everyone else caught this because they were either looking for it on Twitter or just happened to catch it before he deleted the tweet, it was the guy just created a... Lizard Squad account, or like a one where the eye goes, something like that. You know, he just changed one letter, used the same avatar, and tweeted at the guy. And he said, oh, okay, well, you're legit. And he didn't really look into it too much. Uh, obviously, he was easily fooled, and he proceeded to talk to this, this one guy uh, about, about the hack. There's even there was other red flags as well. He identified himself as Ryan Cleary. Um, he said he was an administrator for Lizard Squad which was kind of interesting because actually just a week before he was interviewed, the actual Ryan Cleary that was, was arrested 
uh, I believe by Interpol, because I think I believe he was British. Um, so there actually was a Ryan Cleary that was associated with Lizard Squad, and he was arrested a week before this interview. So it's there were there were numerous red flags that this journalist probably could have picked up on, but he didn't know enough about vetting his uh, sources online and what could be used to trick him that uh, he went ahead with it anyways. And the the whole interview is is pretty silly, but uh, this kind of shows the journalist's lack of understanding of what actually a DDoS is and how they would do it. Because he asked them, says, you know, why do you think Sony and Microsoft's counter move will be? Because he starts referring to it as a chess game and how we, you know, they're playing chess against Microsoft and Sony. And, and this quote that I've underlined, he says, they made a deal with a large DDoS protection company, Prolexic, after apparently deciding they stood no chance against us in-house. Which is really ridiculous. And the guy doesn't call him on it, doesn't say anything, doesn't know any better. He says, oh, so they didn't put up any resistance? Goes, oh, none, none, none that we could detect. And he, he acts like he's you know, really putting the screws to Microsoft when in actuality he's not really doing anything all that special. But uh, meanwhile, when this kind of interview went up, there was a lot of people on Twitter and the security community calling them you know, like the loser squad, the skinny squad. And the, you know, no one was really taking them seriously, obviously. But when you see something like this as just an average user, as an average reader of the Washington Post, a source that they know and understand and, and have some respect for, they see this, that starts to create this really hazy understanding of what the whole, of the whole situation. And this has a, a very real cause and effect. So these users become afraid of the hackers out there that they think are, you know, out to get them or out to get uh, the companies that they like. And so they put lawmakers under pressure to try to crush the hacking and fight against it. The elected officials want to feel that they are trying to do something, and many of them may actually be hoping to make a difference, but they also are regular users. They don't really understand this stuff. So they start trying to put laws in front of people who also don't understand things to hopefully make a difference. And we just end up in this cycle where it's just it's too broad. Things like the changes to the CFAA. Uh, we mentioned earlier the changes to that Rapid7 had to make to Metasploit Pro licensing. Oops, smell my water there. So, and the, the other kind of side of that coin is that the media and corporate training focuses on enterprise security. Users don't recognize that this also affects them at home because they're so focused on watch out for phishing emails at work. You don't want to give your credentials out, you know, that someone can use to get into our work network. You, you know, look, look at these companies being hacked. They don't understand that they're also actually at risk. They're still kind of in that mindset thinking that like, well, if I don't see a bunch of pop-ups on my screen and my PC is not running really slow, I probably don't have a virus and I'm probably good. And anyways, I have Norton installed, so we're good, you know, no problem. They don't understand that they might just become part of a botnet or someone might just be able to get a hold of their personal information from their computer or just install something you can use just to spy on them through the webcam. Things like that that are a bit more nefarious and much quieter than some of the old, just very destructive malware. And, you know, so we know that things like malware have evolved. This, these are, this is CryptoLocker version one, kind of version, uh, versus version two. And this sort of ransomware has actually become much more of a business. It's much easier for them to be infected. And a lot of, most of the time, you know, their AV isn't going to protect them. And again, you know, the users think they're like, well, as long as I avoid porn and weird sites on the internet, I'm not, I'm fine. If I just go to something like the Huffington Post, it'll be okay. But, you know, recently in the news, there was uh, actually kind of a competitor to CryptoWall, because I referred to him as a competitor, because this is kind of a business at this point, uh, actually found a way to use a Flash Zero Day to infect a very real and very big ad network, you know, online ad network. And they were able to create, uh, take a legitimate Hugo Boss ad that was on, uh, I think, 13 or more different websites, including the Huffington Post, a totally legitimate ad infected with CryptoWall, and they infected, uh, you know, probably tens of thousands of people, or who, you know, however many people visited this, those sites when that malicious site was in rotation. And all they had to do was just be unlucky. They visited a site that should, you know, they they totally expected to be safe. They probably trusted explicitly, and they got infected just because, you know, a flash had loaded. But we're actually seeing more and more of this. So the jump from clip structure. Crypto Locker one to two was was a pretty was a pretty big change, but now we're actually getting things like this. Like this is Tesla Crypt. This was 
you know, kind of well designed that's actually a working barcode. They've even went as far as to offer you an option to decrypt one of your files to kind of prove that you were encrypted. And, you know, that, you know, like, hey, they invite you to, hey, try to open up your files. You can't do it. Put it in here. We'll decrypt it for you and we'll show that we can actually do it. And then you'll pay us some money and we'll do the rest. Kind of the interesting thing about Tesla Crypts is that they've started branching out. They want more return on their investment. When they get in and they get a live infection, they want to be able to make sure that that user is incentivized to pay them. And they understand that there's a chance that they could infect a computer that doesn't really have a lot of documents or pictures on it. Maybe it's a, it's just a gaming PC or it's just, you know, kind of a work PC or something that they carry around with them. Uh, you know, they don't really think too much of it. They go, ah, oh, geez, I was in, you know, I was infected. I don't need anything. I'm just going to wipe it. But they've realized that, hey, you know, we can target things like World of Warcraft installations. So they've started encrypting World of Warcraft installations. They encrypt Steam installations, Steam saves. Uh, you know, so basically they'll try to take all your video games away if they, in fact, happen to get a hold of a, uh, of just like someone's gaming PC. They've also gone as far as to now seek out Dropbox folders, things like that to encrypt the Dropbox. So if it is just kind of a PC you take to conferences or something, but you have Dropbox on it, they'll try to get that. You're basically trying to get as many things that they know they can find because they're always kind of in the same place or close by, and they're encrypting all of that to try to get as much as, you know, as many people paying them as possible. So this has kind of become more of a public health hazard than it is just kind of a, a PC or technology issue. And, and so it's actually kind of ironic in a way that we've referred to these things as you know, viruses and things like that for so long, and now they actually really are spreading kind of like a, kind of like a disease where, especially here with Tesla Crypt, they've started, uh, reaching out for devices and shares and other media connected to the PC to also try to infect those. And like I've already mentioned, you can, you know, it's entirely possible that if you have flash, loading up flash ads, you can just visit a website and end up, uh, end up with a, you know, crypto wall or something like it on your PC without too much of an issue not necessarily doing anything wrong. Which leads me kind of into the next thing, kind of the next real world example I want to talk about, which is Snapchat. So users have this expectation that Snapchat does something that, that they want. They want to be able to send a message to someone and have it self-destruct. That sounds really cool. It sounds exactly what they want, so they use it. The problem is that they don't actually understand how any of this works. It's a totally black box service, and they don't realize or are aren't really wired to think that, hey, if I need to, I know that I can log in my Snapchat account after like being gone for two weeks and the messages I was sent are still there. So they don't realize like, well, they must be stored somewhere then. So they actually aren't totally secure. They're actually stored somewhere where someone could look at them and they don't know how long they're stored for, et cetera. And we've seen that that can kind of come back and bite them, uh, especially when they use third party services like the uh, event that happens uh, last year with you know the, the snapping where users that were using snapsave.com as their Snapchat client uh, had 90,000 of their photos and 9,000 videos released because they were, of course, as the name would suggest, being saved on the server and someone was able to get in and steal them. And Snapchat's response was actually pretty cold. Uh, they just said, hey, you were victimized by your own use of the third party service. It's not our problem. But the reason I, I mentioned Snapchat really is because it's relevant to our next, uh, our next example. And this is, this is, uh, Snapchat's own marketing information. This is what they show to their advertisers to try to get people to, uh, give them money. And so this is, this is at least recent as of like the last couple of months. Um, excuse me. Uh, so 50% of their users are between the ages of 13 and 17. And another 31% are between 18 and 24. So by all accounts, you know, over like 80%, uh, so say three quarters of their users are more or less children, you know, or, or like college age, you know, like freshmen. And so this is just, it's overwhelming how many people are using this service as they're, you know, showing you at the bottom graph there of how many, how many snaps are sent every day and how many new users they're getting, how popular they are in different countries. They're always, they're always going, you know, they're moving around, they're spreading, it's becoming a very popular service. And the kind of the problem is this, is, as I already mentioned, they really can't deliver what they're offering. People think like, okay, I can send this message, they get to view it for 20 seconds and it's gone. But, they're not really going out of their way to tell their users or educate them, say, well, like, well, someone could take a screenshot of it. We really can't stop that. 
Uh, even if we could, I mean, in theory, someone could just take another picture with another phone, whatever. Um, you know, don't send anything too sensitive. But people do use this for a lot of sensitive pictures and messages. And it's that kind of lack of understanding of the internet and services like this that uh, led to a, a pretty big incident in uh, last year in Central Virginia in April uh, 2014. So kind of the, the very quick uh, story of this is this is Central Virginia's kind of encounter with self-production. Um, they uh, discovered a Twitter account really by ac or uh, Instagram account, sorry, uh, by accident. A mother just happened to look over the uh, shoulder of her daughter and saw that uh, you know there was a naked girl on her picture or a naked girl on her phone. Took the phone, looked at it, rec realized she recognized the girl, and it was a 15-year-old girl. She scrolled through and saw hundreds of other photos, varying from just girls that were kind of scantily clad or in their underwear to things that were really outrageous and definitely shouldn't have been on Instagram. So she got you know, the school involved because these were all classmates of her daughter, so she knew something was going on. And they got the authorities involved and Instagram involved, and they started an investigation. And they found that there were over 100 teenagers between the ages of 15 and 17 on the Instagram account. Um, as I already mentioned, many of them uh, very exposed. And what really threw them for a loop was that uh, by U.S. law, uh, as it is today, even if you took the picture of yourself, if you are under the age of 18, you have just created child pornography. And by putting it on Instagram, someone distributed child pornography. So this was now almost a, a federal case had this gone too much further. Uh, luckily, they, the local prosecutor and, and the police recognized that this was a really weird thing to them, but it wasn't worth it uh, to go and try to charge anyone as a sex offender. Um, but what did really get them was they, so they looked at the girls that were on, you know, on the Instagram account, called them in, and asked them questions. I said, you know, do you know that this picture was taken, and do you know that it's online? Some of them, of course, were horrified it was online, but no one that they talked to said, like, oh, no, I didn't take it. They all said, oh, I took it, and I sent it to so-and-so. You know, usually, like, another boy at the school or someone like that. And But some of them, what really threw them was that some of the girls actually said, oh, yeah, I actually took that for the Instagram account. I sent that to someone with instructions to upload it. And as they looked into it more and more, they found out that uh, at least the story they've been able to construct is still kind of an open case. Uh, as far as I was able to, I was looking, still trying to find updates as of last week. They haven't actually figured out who it was, but the story they've been able to construct is it sounds like the girls were sending so many of these pictures to the boys that they started sharing them. So kind of that, that first breach of trust that they started, you know, they were kind of creating a collection on their phones of different girls at the school. And someone had the idea uh, some ringleader had the idea that said, well, hey, we don't really want to get caught with these by our parents, so we should put them somewhere. We, we can look at them whenever we want, but you know they're not in a central location where someone could lose them or whatever. So they said, hey, let's put them on Instagram. And their idea was like, well, we want to share it, though. It just can't be one Instagram account that only one of us can access. So they said, well, you can't find anything on Instagram unless you know the username or you know a hashtag. So they created like their own unique hashtag that they put on all the pictures and thought like, well, that's kind of our password. The way you can get the hashtag, they were told by the students, was you would submit a picture, whether you're from yourself, you would give them a picture of yourself or a picture someone sent you that was new that they could upload and they would give you the hashtag so you could find it on Instagram. Once they knew that, they found that this was actually happening at two other schools in the area um, with just slightly tweaked hashtags. It was usually like a, a keyword and then... Uh, kind of something that denoted the school. So they were really kind of thrown off by this, and they, they couldn't wrap their head around the fact that these kids thought that they put something on the internet, something like basically child pornography, and they thought, well, this is totally fine uh, because no one can find it. Obviously, someone did, and when they were told, like, well, it's actually incredibly likely that other people have seen this, it's not just you guys, and also you don't know the they didn't even understand the fundamental fact that they breached someone's trust by sharing a picture uh, with their friends and then uploading it to the internet. They didn't understand, like, well, surely, no, 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 none of us would ever give out the hashtag or tell anyone about the Instagram account. But there's no reason for them to believe that, and there's also no reason for them to take any of those pictures, or no way for any of them uh, to take those pictures back. 
And so this was really kind of a traumatic event for them. They really did not understand the technology they were using or how that would impact them down the road. And uh, so they did some studies at the school trying to talk to the kids to figure out how far this went. You know, were there any uh, pictures that, you know, they, they miss? Uh, were there any other accounts? And so they asked the kids, how many kids in the school do you think are involved in this sort of thing? And they never got an answer that was below 60%, but never got one above 80%. Now, that sounds like a lot. So to kind of compare that to a study that was done in East Texas where they went around and asked a whole bunch of uh, sophomores and juniors whether or not they would send nude pictures to anyone. They found that 28% uh, would at least admit that they had done that. But that doesn't account for people who hadn't done it yet or people that were too embarrassed to say anything. So we can probably say that probably a good third of, of you know, high school students are doing this, at least in certain areas. And they might be doing something like this, where they're, they believe they're sharing it securely or doing something kind of clever, and they're not. And they're actually maybe even doing something like this where it's actually a, a felony. Uh, and something that would be really, really bad for them if, you know, in kind of under different circumstances. So luckily, though, with this story, it it ended at least okay, um, probably because there were so many of them, you know, kind of so many of the girls going through it at the same time that they were able to sort of, you know, support each other and, and get through it. So there was a little bit of bullying, um, you know, I'm sure some trauma, but uh, everyone got through the other side. No one was charged as a sex offender. Everyone's good. But this could have gone really bad. And actually, in 2008, there was a, a girl in Ohio who did the same thing, sent a, sent a picture to a boy, and he shared it with a, just a couple of friends that they knew mutually, and she committed suicide because of the embarrassment. Because, you know, she went through it alone, it was just too much for her to take, and that very easily could have been any of these girls. So this, I you know, it's kind of a, a sad story, but... The reason I bring these these examples up is because the, you know the teenagers uh, are really kind of our most vulnerable group when it comes to technology and security because they don't understand it. We kind of have that old cliche of like, well, grandma doesn't know how to use the PC, or or I need to help mom, you know, look at their look at her email, uh, you know, grandpa can't figure out the iPad, whatever. But it's actually teenagers that are growing up with the technology that we kind of expect to be maybe a little bit more tech savvy, and it's turning out they're more tech uh, they're, they're tech savvy. They can figure out Instagram and things like that, but they're not. Uh, they're not understanding how to use it responsibly. And we've been seeing more and more of that as well, of just irresponsible use of the internet by, by teenagers that are actually getting them into some trouble now. Um, so actually just this, this uh, past couple of weeks, there was an Idaho teenager paid for a DDoS, paid a DDoS, uh, DDoS for hire service to DDoS the school because he didn't want to take a test that day. So he just brought down the school's network for a week and thought, you know, well, cool, they'll never get me, I'll, I'll take it next week. They, he did not understand how to be an awesome hacker and do it. They were able to trace it back to him. And now he's probably going to be expelled and he's facing felony charges in Idaho uh, for computer abuse. And but kind of the bad thing about this is at least he was targeting a school with just a DDoS. There's been a lot worse being used uh, to target schools and the you know, with the internet, such as swatting incidents, uh, which you're not aware, you know, familiar with that. That's where someone puts in a bogus call to, to the local police, you know, with some sort of weird threat that gets the SWAT team to respond. So we've actually had several incidents across the U.S. where armed response has kicked down the door of a school and breached it like they were actually going to deal with a hostage situation with kids and only to find out that they were really bursting into a school of just a bunch of kids, you know, armed to the teeth like they're actually going to, you know, meet resistance. So what, what, what can we do about any of this? So kind of the big thing is when you find good information, share it. You know, pass it around. Uh, you know, this is what the bad guys do. They do it every day. They share their information. So if you find videos or articles you like, you know, if there was any talks here at the conference that you liked, they've all been recorded. You can share it with people. You can bookmark it for later. Um, you know, don't be afraid to sit down and if someone asks you a question, if you have some time, you know, give them some of your own knowledge and ideas. Explain it to them a little bit more than just saying, you know, yes or no, or, or you should do this or that. And try to explain the why, and maybe we can pique their curiosity so that 
if, you know, and if you don't personally have the time or they don't have the time to watch a two hour video, maybe they'll look into it later because you've explained enough to them that they understand like, oh, well, that's interesting. I, now I wonder about this and then kind of go on from there. And, and kind of hand in hand to that is, you know, release some of that knowledge from the echo chamber. We have, you know, these really great conferences like, like here at Circle City Con. We have a lot of really great talks and a lot of these, even though we've recorded them, will go up on irongeek.com and they'll go on the Iron Geek YouTube channel and they'll be shared or viewed mostly by people who couldn't make it to the conference and know where to look for it. Um, I don't, I don't know Adrian's YouTube subscribers, uh, but I feel pretty safe saying that most of them aren't people who just found him on YouTube and subscribe for, you know, because they're interested in security, um, you know, and something caught their eye. They're there because either someone sent them there or they know what to look for and they're probably already going to conferences and getting a lot of that content on their own. So we can kind of, you know, let that out of the echo chamber, you know, send it to people. Um, there's a few people in the security community that I know that do really great work reaching out to, to newspapers and websites saying like, hey, you got this wrong. Let me help you. The next time you need to write an article like this, please contact me and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Even little things like that can really help give people access to you or, you know, encourage people that you know that maybe are, are good working with the media or things like that. Let them know, like, hey, reach out to people and let them, let them get in touch with you and make yourself available so that we can try to uh, avoid misunderstandings. And you can also do this by branching out. You know, go to de uh, developer conferences. This is really great for new speakers as well. If you've never spoken at a conference but you think you might like it, go to a development conference. Because there's actually a lot of development conferences, they have security tracks that get packed. Because the developers that are going to these conferences understand that security is important. And they're kind of those, the smaller group of people that are really good at what they do and they understand what's important. They understand what's important. So they're going to be the ones that when they see a security talk, they flock to it. I've, I've heard from people who speak at these conferences and they say that, yeah, hands down, their talk was packed. There's people out the door waiting for them to talk because they were there just to, to speak about security and there was a lot of developers that wanted to hear them talk. It might have been old news for security people, but the developers hadn't heard it before. No one's going to those conferences to teach them. You can also talk to other departments, your coworkers and your peers, people that you know that you can see every day. You can start answering their questions because you see them every day, so it's a little bit less of an investment for you. Uh, so you can kind of teach them over a long period of time. And kind of the last part is, you know, use language to gain an advantage. You can find common ground with them. I, I've mentioned a few times that I feel that cyber is kind of a, while we hate it, it's something that we can actually use. It's, it is kind of the language of the users. It's what they've picked up on. It's what they use. They respond to that word pretty well. And they understand what it means. So don't be afraid to use it. When we throw around a lot of jargon, they just kind of their eyes glaze over or they start replacing words that we think that they'll understand with definitions that they have from like CSI Cyber or the media, things like that. That gray area where they've kind of filled in their own ideas. But we also don't want to oversimplify it because when you oversimplify it, that's when you start getting into that training territory where you're just telling them like, hey, don't click on LinkedIn notifications that you, you know, if you weren't expecting to receive it because it's probably phishing and, and don't, you know, don't click on those links for, you know, if they look like this, whether rather than teaching them and educating them, here's how you can try to spot a phishing email. Here's how you can look at the headers if you're really not sure, you know, here you can, you know, or like I kind of go back to the previous points, make yourself available to say like, hey, if you need a question, you know, feel free to call me up or forward the email to me and I'll let you know if it looks legit. That's pretty much my talk. Um, thank you guys for, for coming out. And uh, <laughs> I know it was really early <laughs> to come out. So uh, I, will, I will add one more, one more thing since I know I have, like, I have like five minutes and I can probably take a couple of questions if anyone has comments. Um, I was encouraged to give you guys an uh, kind of a, a big thank you for the end. So Amanda, uh, uh, info sister from uh, who you've probably seen around the conference. She's done an awesome job uh, coming out and wrangling the volunteers, and she wanted uh, you guys to. Do... Video I do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
This was last night. <laughs> so there's also, now that, now that you've seen that, I will, uh, like I said, she's doing an awesome job with the volunteer work. She also has, if you've uh, listened to the uh, Reboot It podcast at all, um, episode nine she's on. She talks about a lot of the things that we've talked about here, but she has a little bit of a different take. It covers a, a couple of different sides of it. And they do actually a really great job. Um, she also has, speaking of throwing talks out there and sharing them, she has a talk that she gave here at Circle City Con and a few other places called Shooting Fish in a Barrel, where she goes over a fishing program and what she did. And it's actually a really great kind of look at how she tackled this problem of users and how she was going to relate to them and get them to care about security and make them understand that it was relevant to them and learn from it. So thank you very much. Is there, did anyone have any, any questions? We do have like five minutes if, or you can lay down and take a nap. <laughs> All right, thanks guys.